Hi. This video is the fourth in a series intended to introduce people to the philosophy of existentialism. In the last video in this series, I explored how existentialism emerged in light of several important contextual factors, most of which had to do with history and culture. In this video, I'll narrow the focus quite a bit and look specifically at existentialism's point of origin. Then, in the next video in this series, I'll situate existentialism's primary thinkers and texts within its overall timeline. So let's look at existentialism's origin. If you've been following this series of videos, you're probably already aware that existentialism proper began in the early mid 19th century with the Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard. And by the way, if you want to hear a more expansive treatment of Kierkegaard's philosophy, you can see my video entitled Kierkegaard in 19 Minutes. I'll put a link to it in the description of this video if you're interested. Anyhow, Kierkegaard's philosophy was primarily a response to two things. The state of Christianity in Europe during the early mid 19th century and the vision of history and of life propounded some years earlier by the highly influential German philosopher George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. For Kierkegaard, in parallel with the age of industrial production that was fast approaching, Christianity had become something mechanical and consequently hollow, something devoid of genuine passion and genuine commitment. It had become mostly a set of rote habits and social conventions rather than the access point for a powerful personal experiential relation to God. So part of Kierkegaard's original formulation of existentialism had to do with reawakening a deep and powerful sense of Christianity and the Christian life. However, what I'd like to focus on much more is Kierkegaard's response to Hegel, whose influence during the time and for many decades afterwards was immense. So to understand this side of existentialism's origin, we need to understand a few things about Hegel. Probably the first thing to note is that Hegel was born in 1770, 43 years before Kierkegaard. And although their lifespans overlap by 18 years, Hegel's reputation and influence was already well established and formidable by the time Kierkegaard approached adulthood. So what was Hegel's philosophy all about? Well, basically, it was a theory about how history happens, first within philosophy itself, but also within the world more generally. And the central process by which history unfolds is called dialectic. By the way, a side note on vocabulary. When people use the word dialectic or dialectical in an everyday generic way, they usually mean a relationship between two or more things that is mutual and simultaneous, as if those things were having a kind of conversation with each other. However, the word dialectic means something much more specific and technical in a Hegelian or Marxist context. Anyhow, the word as it pertains to Hegel's theory denotes the way that historical events and forces come into tension with their counterparts or opposites to generate new historical syntheses, the overall process of which he calls geist or spirit. An example. During the 20th century, those nations that had been espousing the ideal of capitalism and free markets came into tension with those that espoused communism and socialism, most obviously in the form of the Cold War, but also in the form of smaller proxy wars in various parts of the world, such as in Vietnam. And what was the outcome of all of this? Well, it wasn't just that capitalism eventually won out over the socialist systems because the supposedly capitalist nations themselves ended up becoming much more socialist along the way. And if you don't believe that, try not paying your property taxes for a few years. After your eviction, you'll probably discover that the government has actually owned your home all along and has been effectively renting it to you just at a much lower rate than you'd otherwise have to pay, and with your name on a deed instead of a rental agreement. In other words, the tension between capitalist and socialist nations eventually generated a new historical synthesis where pretty much every nation on earth is a hybridized combination of the two, 
with some inevitable degree of variation, of course. Okay, a few other things to note about Hegel's idea of Geist and the process of historical dialectic. First, he saw the overarching oppositional dynamics that ultimately constitute history as immense tidal forces, far larger than any individual. In other words, history isn't actually about famous people doing famous things. Instead, it's about how huge dialectical dynamics are seeking their expression and manifestation through specific individuals. For instance, the real historical truth of Lindbergh's flight across the Atlantic wasn't actually about Lindbergh or the spirit of St. Louis. It was really about the way the evolving combination of science and industry were opposing the physical constraints of the natural world. And if Lindbergh hadn't crossed the Atlantic for whatever reason, well, someone else like him would have done so in short order because that's what the dynamics of Geist were calling for at the time. And the new synthesis that eventually arose out of that dialectical tension was, well, it was a world where airplanes are constantly traversing all the world's oceans every single day, 24-7. In other words, the world as we now know it. But the point is that individuals, whether they're aviators or presidents or dictators or other historically salient figures, don't really count for much in comparison to the currents and demands of the dialectic. That's what's really producing historical events, and individuals, even famous world historical individuals, are simply people whose attributes match the demands of the prevailing dialectical forces that are at play at the time. Okay, second. For Hegel, all of this is ultimately a rationally comprehensible process. However, it doesn't operate according to rationality the way the natural sciences conceive it, where the validity of our truths revolves mostly around our being able to predict what we'll see in the future, especially in the form of empirical observations that will hopefully confirm our hypotheses. Instead, the logic of the dialectic is retrospectively rational, and not predictively rational. As they say, Hindsight is 2020, and for the most part, that's how history becomes coherent for us, not as a function of our being able to predict where it will go in the future with any reasonable degree of reliability. For Hegel, all of these realizations about how historical process happens constitute what he famously declared was the end of history. Not in the sense that the world would cease giving birth to new historical syntheses, but in the sense that they would all be henceforth comprehensible within a Hegelian framework. Okay, so what was Kierkegaard's existential response to all of this? Well, part of it goes like this. Yes, at one level of description, it may well be the case that overarching dialectical dynamics are the main force that drives human history. But that says very little about the reality of our lives as we actually know them from day to day. And that's the level of immediacy where we actually live and breathe. No one goes to all of the trouble to get out of bed in the morning and engage the joys and sorrows of the world just to play some negligible microscopic role in universal historical geist. What really constitutes our lives as we actually experience them is the immediate reality of our existential freedom and responsibility. So, in place of Hegel's idea of dialectical process, Kierkegaard proposes a kind of existential dialectic, a dialectic of individual decisions and passions with respect to the world we inhabit. For Kierkegaard, that's the level of description that really matters because it's the one that directly impacts the quality of our lives as we actually experience them. So, in response to Hegel's diminution of the importance of the individual, Kierkegaard sees the individual, and individual decisiveness, as the only forces that really matter. The rest is just intellectual fun and games, even if there's a measure of truth in it. Living as a singular human being by creating a unique and distinct path in life is what counts most within the sphere of human reality. And as for the purported rationality of the dialectic, well that too is of little consequence, mostly because, as Pascal once put it about 150 years before Kierkegaard, <laughs> 
The heart has its own reasons that reason knows not of. In other words, our passions are what really guide human affairs far more thoroughly than our capacity for reason does. Our reason may be good for divining the equations that determine the properties of physical matter, for example, but our passions are what compel us to get out of bed in the morning, endure life's inevitable suffering, and ultimately wend our way toward a destiny. So it doesn't actually matter too much whether history is retrospectively rational or not. What matters, once again, is the dimension of existential decisiveness, how we throw ourselves into life in one way or another, and ultimately how we experience it, which is primarily a matter of the heart, a matter of subjective truth, as Kierkegaard puts it. So here we see in microcosm a lot of the dynamics we discussed in the previous video in this series, which had to do with existentialism's response to the industrial age. In response to the industrial age's insistence on seeing life primarily in rational terms, existentialism calls for an equitable rebalancing of the tension between our reason and our passions. In response to the diminishment of the individual in the face of anonymous collective forces such as those of modern bureaucracy and mechanized production, <laughs> or perhaps universal geist, existentialism gives voice to the equally important dimension of our individual lives and our unique experience of life. So, all in all, Kierkegaard's response to Hegelian philosophy isn't about trying to refute the validity of its principal findings, but about demonstrating that they're relevant to our lives only in a very abstract, tangential way. The problem with the Hegelian view of history is that in trying to provide an account of the grand totality of things, it passes over the particularity of our lives, the place where we actually live and breathe, which is at least as important as all of the large abstract dynamics that may govern our lives in the macrocosm. However, within the larger arc of the history of philosophy, the joke may well have been on Kierkegaard, because his oppositional response to Hegel would be exactly the kind of thing the dialectic would predict in the first place, especially since it would hold that every significant historical event calls for attention with its antithesis, and in many ways Kierkegaard's philosophy was just that. So <laughs> take that, Soren. Anyhow, as I said in the beginning of this video, in the next video in this series, I'd like to situate some of existentialism's primary thinkers and texts within the arc of its history. Then, in the video after that, I'd like to move the timeline up to the point of existentialism's denouement, especially with respect to the rise of structuralism, and then post-structuralism, deconstructionism, and postmodernism. Until then, enjoy the day. Peace out.